purpose of this course is to teach you the essential legal concepts that will help you excel in law school and beyond. I've focused on tools that you can deploy across a wide range of contexts. As a law student, you'll learn plenty of things about specific areas of law, but the tools that I'm going to be talking about are transubstantive. These concepts will help you understand and manipulate legal rules across a wide set of subjects. Instead of teaching you about contract law's mailbox rule, I'll be teaching you about the difference between rules versus standards. My emphasis is on news you can use. These concepts form an important part of the canon of how to think like a lawyer. I emphasize the toolidness of these concepts because learning them will help you better analyze and manipulate the specific laws that you study in different courses. Lawyers and legal academics in crafting a line of argument make certain moves to support their case. Learning the terminology for the concepts in this course will make it easier for you to make certain moves. You could think of them as law school's mastery hacks. I'm going to try to give you some analytic arrows for your 1L quiver. Many of these concepts are dichotomous distinctions, oppositions that will help you better categorize legal rules and see what regulatory choices the law has made. Learning these concepts will teach you something important about the underlying structure of legal rules themselves. The lectures provide a kind of periodic table for legal thought, disclosing the basic elements of legal argumentation. In, pre in preparing these lectures, I've been guided by what I'd want to make sure a beloved niece or nephew knew before embarking on a career in law. So while I focused on conceptual tools that are known by all well-educated lawyers, I've also thrown in practical tools on how to better read statutes, brief cases, participate in class, and even excel on exams. There's no reason why you can't learn these things before listening to your first law school class. Indeed, if you find these concepts inherently uninteresting, you might reconsider whether matriculating to law school is right for you. If you've completed your first year of law school and are not already familiar with almost all of these concepts, something has gone wrong with your education. So this course is also for law students who somehow have managed to miss out before they graduated, as well as for those who want to get a head start on their first year of law school. The course syllabus orders the concepts and the lectures cross-reference related concepts but I've also attempted to keep the lectures modular so that you should feel free to skip around or pick the lectures that seem most relevant. While some of the concepts covered are absolutely foundational, it might be less intimidating to think of these materials as the web equivalent of a toilet book. You know, the kind of book where you can pick up uh, a tool of the day in just a few minutes. Finally, let me confess that my selection of tools has a slight law and economics bias. As Tony Cronman once said, economics is the science of means. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, it, more than any other social science, provides the tools of optimization. I'm a PhD economist as well as a lawyer, and my understanding of these concepts is informed by my background. But in these lectures, you'll also find tools of psychology, political science, and history represented well. Ward Farnsworth has written a closely related and excellent book called The Legal Analyst, a toolkit for thinking about the law, which was published by the University of Chicago Press, which I highly recommend as a complement to these lectures. More prosaically, you can also find many of these subjects covered, of course, on Wikipedia. So here's a bonus tool for those who are planning to go to law school. Get a friend or loved one who's a lawyer to meet with you twice the summer before uh, to introduce you to the law library. One of the hour meetings 
uh, should focus on how to cite and find cases, and the other hour should teach you how to cite and find statutes and regulations. Law libraries, both in their online and in their dead tree forms, are not intuitive, and first years are forced to learn them at the same time when they are learning the substantive rules of torts and contracts and their other first year classes. If my niece or nephew were about to start law school, I'd want them to have an introduction to the library before taking their first substantive class. So that's my advice to you too. Uh, bonus rule number two, memorize the names of the current Supreme Court justices. When I was a first year student, there was a, an embarrassing moment in front of my classmates uh, in the first month of classes where it was clear that I couldn't remember the names of one of the sitting justices. You should be able to say with confidence that Scalia, Thomas, Alito, Roberts, and Kennedy are more conservative, that Breyer, Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan are more liberal, and you should probably know that Kennedy is the most important swing vote, at least on some issues. You can use the rules, standards, distinction to categorize any law or regulation that you learn for the rest of your law school career. To understand this distinction, consider a classic example of speed limits. A law regulating driving speed could require drivers to drive less than 40 miles per hour, or they might require drivers to drive at a reasonable speed. The former kind of injunction is a rule, the latter is a standard. The 40 miles per hour speed limit is a rule because it's clear, objectively measurable, and most importantly, knowable in advance, ex ante. In contrast, the drive at a reasonable speed law is a standard. A standard is a law that is fuzzier than a rule. With standards, it's harder to know in advance how a judge or agency will evaluate a particular setting. Was driving at a speed of 40 miles per hour reasonable given that fog was reducing somewhat normal visibility? Laws that turn on what is reasonable or prudent tend to be standards. With a standard, you might not know whether you violated the law until after a court has adjudicated the issue. If you look closely, you'll see that every expression of a legal right or duty will fall into one of these categories. Any law can be categorized either as a rule or as a standard. So as you encounter each new holding of a case or each new statutory provision, you can ask yourself, is this law a rule or a standard? Should it be a rule or a standard? Sometimes a law might be expressed as a rule when a standard would be better, uh, better suited to the situation or vice versa. Sometimes it's better to use both a rule and a standard. Indeed, most jurisdictions require highway motorists to drive 55 miles or fewer miles per hour and to drive prudently, which, is, uh, which in bad weather might be considerably slower than 55 miles per hour. You should also understand that rules versus standard distinction, you should understand this distinction uh, while presented as a dichotomy, it's often more of a continuum. Consider the law regarding uh, the contract price in the absence of an expressed term. What should be the default understanding, the presumptive price, if neither party mentions it in a contract? More specifically, should the law adopt a rule or a standard? On the standards end of the spectrum, the contract law might establish that the default price should be a reasonable price and uh, depend on the totality of the circumstances. At the rule end of that same continuum, a jurisdiction might instead specify that the price for a particular good or service will be $100. Somewhere in the middle would be a rule that says the default price is the market price on the day of the performance. The market price default is more rule-like than totality of the circumstances default but more standard-like than the $100 default. The Uniform Commercial Code 
has adopted the standard-like reasonable price default uh, via the UCC section 2305. But instead of using a more rule-like default to cover instances where a contract fails to mention the contract uh, uh, quality, the default quantity price under the UCC is effectively zero. It's, it's more of a rule than a standard. If your contract fa fails to name a price, contract law assumes you want a reasonable price. If your contract fails to mention a quantity, contract law assumes you want to trade zero items. Why would the law choose a standard to govern the default price, but a rule to govern the default quantity? Training yourself to think of laws as rules or standards is a powerful tool to help you both describe and critique the cases you encounter. Try to think of a constitutional provision that is relatively rule-like and another provision that is more of a standard. Think about the holding of the last case you read in any class. Did the court articulate a rule or a standard? What is it about the holding that tells you where the holding falls on the rules standard continuum? When should standards be preferred to rules? That's your homework. The normative-positive dichotomy distinguishes between two different kinds of argumentation. This difference is sometimes referred to as the difference between is talk and ought talk. A normative claim is ought talk. A normative claim about the law is captured by the classic plea, there ought to be a law. Normative debates are about what the content of the law should be. In contrast, Positive analysis of law seeks to identify what the law is. Positive claims are hence capable of being correct or incorrect. It is a markedly different inquiry to ask what is the speed limit than to ask what should be the speed limit. As beginning law students, you will be naturally caught up in learning the details of what the law is, but you should make sure to ask as well what the content of legal rules should be. Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., in his book, The Common Law, said, the life of the law has not been logic, it has been experience. The felt necessities of the time, the prevalent moral and political theories, intuitions of public policy, avowed or unconscious, even the prejudices which judges share with their fellow men have had a good deal more to do than the syllogism in determining the rules by which men should be governed. By the way, that first line is maybe the most important uh, single sentence in all of American jurisprudence. While logic might help you derive certain positive claims, Holmes claimed that the positive content of legal rules could be identified by investigating how they were used in practice. The Scottish philosopher David Hume argued that no ought claim could be correctly inferred from a set of purely factual premises. This result is sometimes referred to as Hume's law or as the is-ought problem. The idea has important implications for law. Hume's law means that the fact of a mass shooting by itself can never be sufficient to conclude that we should pass new gun control laws. You can only derive should claims from premises that include should claims. You just can't get from is to ought by itself. As with other dichotomies in these lectures, the distinction between the normative and the positive is not always cut and dried. Normative, nominally positive claims, such as Richard Doc Dawkins' 2013 tweet saying, quote, all the world's Muslims have fewer Nobel Prizes than Trinity College, Cambridge. They did great things in the Middle Ages, though, unquote, can be criticized as having normative overtones. 
Dawkins tweet raises the normative question of why we should focus our attention on this fact instead of whether Dawkins navel hair rotates in a clockwise or counterclockwise fashion. One way that I have papered over the normative motivations of my own analysis in writing articles is by converting normative characterizations of what law should be into nominally positive claims about what people with certain normative predispositions would favor. Thus, instead of arguing that the law should adopt a particular rule that has efficiency enhancing properties, I have intended to say instead that, quote, efficiency minded lawmakers would favor a particular rule. Following Hume, it is a good practice to think about and state the possible normative implications of your analysis. Some historians resist this practice. They might claim that they are studying a particular aspect of history because it's interesting. I'm attracted to the opposite extreme, which as a provocation might be stated, legal scholarship is only interesting if it might inform presentist normative decision making. A presentist normative claim is a claim about how the law should be today or in the future. Another way to put this is that legal scholarship is only interesting if it is consequentialist in the sense that something might turn on it. Uncovering facts about the world as it is and or as it was can definitely satisfy this criterion. But not all facts or histories satisfy this criterion. Learning whether my navel hair turns clockwise is uninteresting because it fails this consequentialist test. You can elicit the hidden normative motivations of people. Uh, uh, you can find out what's behind their nominally positive claims simply by asking the author, so what? I've had the experience of asking hardcore, non-normative historians the question, so? so, or so what, until they finally spill the beans and provide a normative defense of their enterprise, why they studied a particular topic. Thinking more explicitly about the positive normative dichotomy can help discipline you to avoid the laziness inherent in the claim, I just think the topic is interesting. The deeper question is why that subject is interesting, which is always a normative matter. I said that I offered as a provocation the idea that only facts which inform normative questions are interesting. What are other defensible criteria for interesting scholarship? Ex ante and ex post mean respectively from before and from after. The ex ante and ex post perspectives are always defined with regard to some event that might occur or has occurred. For example, think about how you should respond to learning about a cheating spouse. The ex ante perspective asks before the cheating has occurred, before the fact, what will be a spouse's best response to cheating? From this perspective, you might be more likely to want to threaten harsh consequences to deter your spouse from cheating. In contrast, the ex post perspective asks after the cheating has occurred, after the fact, what is the best response? Ex post, you might be drawn to less harsh reactions since it's no longer possible to deter what already has occurred. Ex ante, we might want to deter unauthorized immigration with the threat of punishment and deportation. Ex post, we might prefer a path to citizenship. These perspectives resonate in different ways with our system's three core lawmakers, juries, judges, and legislators. Juries are placed in the ex post position. They are assembled to adjudicate what should happen to litigants after the supposed wrong has occurred. The quality of mercy more often resonates with the ex post perspective. 
In contrast, judges sit and announce rules that govern as precedent the future parties as well as the current litigants before them, and are more likely to adopt rules that make sense from the ex-ante perspective. For example, Ward Farnsworth, in talking about the ex-ante, ex-post distinction, uses an Illinois Supreme Court decision concerning a bank thief who went into a bank, put a gun to the head of an innocent customer, and demanded that a bank teller give the thief $5,000 or the thief would kill the customer. The teller refused, the thief executed the customer, and the customer's estate sued the bank. The ex post perspective here focuses on the bank's behavior after the threat has been made. To get used to focusing in on the event at issue, you should become comfortable using phrases like ex post the threat, was the bank's behavior reasonable? Given that a threat has occurred, ex post the threat, it seems unreasonable for the teller as the bank's representative to refuse the demand. After all, a life is more valuable, much more valuable than $5,000. But the Illinois Supreme Court, in deciding the case uh, uh, in favor of the bank, took much more of an ex-ante perspective. Looking at the policy ex-ante, the threat, the court reasoned, quote, in this particular case, the result may appear to be harsh and unjust, but for the protection of future business invitees, we cannot afford to extend to the criminal another weapon in his arsenal." Unquote. From the ex-ante perspective, denying liability reduces the criminal arsenal because uh, future criminals cannot, by killing customers, threaten to impose liability on banks if the banks refuse to give the robber money. Denying liability in this case might deter future bank robberies and thus protect future business invitees, that is, future customers. Judges are unique in our legal system because their job focuses them to engage in a mixture of ex post and ex ante decision making deciding the case before them, as well as creating precedents that will influence the decision in future disputes. Indeed, at times, judges will announce rules that apply only to prospective disputes, meaning that they apply one rule to the litigants before them, but another uh, and a different rule will apply to the future litigants. Legislators and regulators are positioned dominantly to promulgate rules that will apply prospectively and thus naturally are likely to take the ex-ante perspective. Hence, legislators are keenly attuned to ex-ante deterrence arguments. But even here, legislatures might pay attention to how stiff criminal penalties have, how stiff criminal penalties have led to high fiscal and social costs of mass incarceration. And even legislatures might therefore take ex post considerations into account even when choosing prospective rules. In contractual settings, there is often more possibility of agreement ex ante, the creation of the contract, than ex post its formation. For example, imagine a, a far-fetched hypothetical. You own Walton's Mountain and have entered into an agreement to sell timber to Cut-Up Industries, one of five wood mills. Uh, the standard mill contract calls upon you to cut the timber and float the logs down the river to the mill. You've chosen to contract with Cut Up Industries, even though it is furthest downstream uh, uh, and therefore harder to get the logs downstream, because it has offered you by far the most money for your timber, $10 per cubic foot. At the appointed time, you cut and float the logs downstream and you tender the logs to cut up. Uh, industries, but now cut up is saying they don't have to pay you because the sun is in their eyes, quote unquote. And this somehow makes it more difficult for them to mill your timber. They're only willing to pay you $3 per cubic foot, much lower than any of the other mills offered and, and much lower than what cut up promised to pay you. But because cut up is further downstream than any of the other mills, it's not feasible to take your logs to another mill, and you reluctantly accept the $3, uh, but 
sue Cutup for breach of contract. Cutup defends by arguing that the sun was in their eyes and that uh, made buying your logs uh, impractical. The court now needs to decide whether to recognize this crazy sun in the eyes uh, contractual defense. Think about the likely briefs that the court will receive from you, from Cutup, and from your two respective industry uh, groups. It's easy to imagine that Cutup will argue in favor of such a defense and that you will argue against it. After all, there's money on the line and each of you would prefer to have it. But what about the uh, respective industry groups? Uh, what is the mill association and the timber association likely to argue at, in their friends of the court amicus briefs? Well, the timber association, like you, uh, will argue that uh, this uh, sun in the eyes defense uh, makes no sense. But the surprise is, is that the mill association, the association representing other mills, might very well join them. While some students will think that the mill association will always side in litigation with one of their members, the mill association has multiple members to worry about. The mills who want to enter into future milling agreements with timber owners might not want the court to recognize a sun in the eyes defense. If this defense is inefficient, then the defense might reduce the joint gains of trade. It might hurt mill owners. More concretely, timber owners might start demanding that mills pay in advance. And paying in advance, in turn, might subject mills to the risk that the logs floated downstream will be poor quality. The lit litigants making arguments about a past dispute are naturally in the ex post position and unavoidably in opposition about who should bear the cost of particular risks. But the trade association cares more about the future parties who are in the ex ante position. From the ex ante position, parties are much more likely to embrace legal rules that enhance the joint gains of trade. When we talk about what the future parties want, we're essentially taking the ex ante perspective. Ex ante perspectives are particularly prized in law and economics. One of the worst criticisms a law and economic professor can hear is to have someone point out that her analysis failed to consider what is efficient from the ex ante perspective. And while law and economics uses the ex ante perspective to analyze efficiency, in another lecture I'll be talking about how John Rawls used a more radical ex ante perspective, what is called being behind the veil of ignorance, to analyze equity. Let me end with a cautionary tale about thinking from the ex ante perspective. Imagine that Professor Hart has just arrived at Truth University for a year-long visit. He's out to dinner with Professor Econohead, who mentions that she is planning to sell her eight-year-old family car when the school year begins. She figures she can take it down to the university quad and quickly be able to sell it to an incoming student with no muss or fuss for $2,500, which is $500 less than its blue book value. Professor Hart interjects that he is interested in buying a car and asks if he can have a mechanic inspect uh, the car. McConaughey is reluctant. Uh, she says, I'll let you borrow the car, but only if you won't tell me if you find anything wrong with it. You don't have to buy it for $2,500. Just promise not to tell me why you're not buying it. Professor Hart agrees and takes the car to his mechanic. The next day, Professor Hart calls Professor Econohead, and they have the following conversation. Hart, I'm sorry, but my mechanic found something wrong with your car. Econohead, don't tell me. Hart, it's a safety problem. Econohead, don't tell me. Hart, well, that doesn't seem right, but okay. After this conversation, should Professor Econohead be liable if he sells the car without disclosing the safety problem and the buyer is subsequently hurt by the latent condition? The answer to this question is a pretty straightforward yes. You sold a car with knowledge that it might have a safety problem, you're, you're, you're going to have a liability. 
But a harder and more interesting problem is to think about the legal responsibility of Professor Hart. Professor Hart promised not to tell if a mechanic found something wrong. How should the law treat the breach of that confidentiality promise? One response is to hold that the non-disclosure agreement is, uh, should be unenforceable as against public policy. Professor Hart should be free to disclose any negative information without risking legal liability. But this result does not help make the world better when judged from the ex-ante perspective. If the non-disclosure agreement, if non-disclosure agreements, which basically said that, remember, Econohead would allow his car to be inspected only if Hart promised not to disclose negative information, if that kind of non-disclosure agreement is unenforceable, then Econohead would not have lent her car. She would have simply sold the car to some student on the quad who would be in the same situation of driving the car without knowing about the safety defect. It might be wiser to enforce the non-disclosure agreement and to hold Professor Hart liable if he failed to disclose a safety defect. If the mechanic found a safety problem, Hart would have to either pay a small amount, roughly equal to the cost of requiring, of repairing the safety problem for uh, breaching the promise of non-disclosure, or pay a much larger amount for withholding the valuable safety information. Enforcing the non-disclosure agreement might thus induce Hart to disclose and pay O'Connorhead small damages. Notwithstanding the possibility of liability, Hart might still enter into this kind of agreement. Hart would get the benefit of knowing whether the car was in good condition and might not face any liability if the mechanic said that the car was fine or only found non-safety problems, such as the radio being broken. Ex ante analysis might suggest that enforcing the non-disclosure agreement and coupling breach damages with higher tort damages for non-disclosure of safety concerns would produce a more efficient and safe equilibrium. But very few people are willing to go this far in embracing ex-ante thinking. Absolving the bank for the teller's unwillingness to pay off uh, uh, for a money or her life threat is one thing, but holding someone liable for non-disclosure of a safety concern is a bridge too far. Thus, while law and economics people tend to strongly prefer the ex-ante analysis as a descriptive matter, our legal regime in, in different contexts displays a mixture of ex-ante and ex-post analysis in its decision making. Here's a final and much simpler puzzler for you to ponder from the ex post and ex ante perspective. If the purpose of exams is to get students to study the material, then on the day of the exam, after the studying is done, should professors make exams optional? This amazingly simple tool is a powerful way to generate the possibility of new legal rules. The tool asks you to keep an eye out for two by two distinctions, which can visually be displayed in a four quadrant box. Let's start with a simple example that is taken from an article by Stephen Crowley and John Hansen. These authors were thinking about how accident law treats non-pecuniary losses, which include losses from pain and suffering. They realized that accident law could consider the existence of pain and suffering either to determine whether the defendant was negligent or to determine the amount of damages for defendants who have been found negligent or for both determinations. So the decision of whether to consider evidence of pain and suffering is really two independent decisions. This gave rise to the following two-by-two two box. Crowley and Hansen saw that by using a two-by-two two box that there were four different legal approaches which might be used. Can you see why approach two might be 
uh, superior to approach four? Whenever you learn that the law over time or in different jurisdictions has taken three different approaches to regulation, you should ask yourself whether it's possible to display these three approaches in a two by two matrix and thereby uncover a hidden fourth approach. This method of uncovering a hidden fourth rule is just what professor, then dean, now judge Guido Calabresi and his co-author Doug Melamed did in one of the most cited law review articles of all time, Property Rules, Liability Rules, and Inalienability, One View of the Cathedral. It's my favorite law review article. The authors explored a classic nuisance dispute between Tawny, a potential polluter, and Marshall, Tawny's neighbor. And here's a quote. Traditionally, the nuisance pollution problem is viewed in terms of three rules. First, Tawny may not pollute unless his neighbor, his only neighbor, let's assume, Marshall, allows it. That rule basically says Marshall may enjoin Tawny's nuisance. Second, Tawny may pollute but must compensate Marshall for damages caused. That rule says nuisance is found, but the remedy is limited to damages. Third, Tawny may pollute at will and can only be stopped by Marshall if Marshall pays him off. That rule says that Tawny's pollution is not held to be a nuisance to Marshall. In, in our terminology, rules one and two, nuisance with injunction and with damages only, are entitlements to Marshall. The first is an entitlement to be free from pollution and is protected by a property rule. The second is also an entitlement to be free from pollution, but is protected only by a liability rule. These first two rules are depicted in this two by two box uh, in this top row, where Marshall is the resident who gets the initial entitlement under either rule one or rule two, and that the difference between these first two rules is, is that rule one is where Marshall is protected by a property rule by an injunction, and rule two is where Marshall's initial entitlement is protected merely by damages. Rule three, and now I'll go back to the qu quoting the great article. <laughs> rule three, which is the no nuisance rule, is instead an entitlement to Tawny, protected by a property rule. For only by buying Tawny out at Tawny's price can Marshall end the pollution. And this rule three is depicted down here where the initial entitlement to pollute is given to the polluter, Tawny, and it's protected by a property rule that uh, Marshall can go to jail uh, if, uh, if uh, uh, he tries to interfere with that uh, pollution. B uh, back to Calabresi and Melamed, the, and this is the key moment where they used this two by two box as a tool to see a new rule. And this is what they said. The very statement of these rules in the context of our framework suggests that something is missing. Missing is a fourth rule, representing an entitlement in Tawny to pollute, but an entitlement which is protected only by a liability rule. The fourth rule, really a kind of partial eminent domain coupled with a benefits tax, can be stated as follows. Marshall may stop Tawny from polluting, but if he does, he must compensate Tawny." Unquote. The authors used the two-by-two two box as a tool for discovering additional legal possibilities. Indeed, in a well-known vignette outlined by David Kennedy and William Fisher, Calabresi and Melamed's analysis seemed to call the missing fourth rule into existence. Kennedy and Fisher, and now I'm quoting them, the credibility of the essay was much enhanced by a nearly simultaneous ruling by the Arizona Supreme Court in an unusual nuisance dispute. At issue in Spur Industries versus Dell Webb Development Corporation was a demand by the developer of a rapidly expanding retirement community that a pre-existing cattle feedlot be shut down because it generated odors and flies that annoyed the community residents. Trying to balance several competing considerations, the seriousness of the harm, the fact that the developer 
by building houses in close proximity to the feedlot had come to the nuisance and the innocence of the community residents, the court granted an injunction against the continued operation of the feedlot, but required the developer to indemnify the feedlot operator, quote, for a reasonable amount of the cost of moving or sh shutting down, unquote. Such a composite ruling, it should be uh, apparent, is an example of Calabresian Melamed's Rule 4. The court seems to have been unaware of their as yet unpublished article, but its ruling provides strong support for the author's contention that a purchased injunction might make it possible to reconcile seemingly incompatible distributional and efficiency goals. So for uh, discussion, do you think you can apply this tool to generate a new legal rule? See if you can handle this pop quiz. The common law of contract has three traditional ways to calculate monetary damages. Number one is expectation damages have the objective quote, to put the injured party in as good a position as he would have been in if the, con if the contract had been performed. Number two, reliance damages have the objective to put the injured party back in the position he would have been in if the contract had not been made. And three, restitution damages have the objective to put the party in breach back in the position he would have been in if the contract had not been made. What would the two-by-two two box tool suggest as a fourth rule? The effect of many of the rules that you will learn in law school can be altered by agreement of the parties. Rules that the parties can contract around are often called default or gap-filling rules. Just as word processing software establishes default margins that a user can alter by changing the settings, many rules are merely legal presumptions that only govern when the parties have remained silent in the absence of agreements to the contrary. Default rules can be established by common law courts or by legislatures. When a court decision says, as Judge Cardozo wrote in Jacob and Young versus Kent, that future parties are, quote, free by apt in certain words, unquote, to contract for an alternative result, the decision is announcing a default rule. When a statute prescribes a rule that will apply, quote, unless otherwise indicated, unquote, in a private contract, it is announcing a default rule. But many times, statutes and decisions will not expressly address whether a particular rule can be altered by private agreement or what words would be sufficient to accomplish such altering. When a rule is merely a default, it's important to understand the necessary and sufficient requirements for opting out of it, or what are known as altering rules. The UCC, the Uniform Commercial Code, Section 2206-1A, for example, establishes the default that an offer invites acceptance, quote, in any manner and by any medium reasonable in the circumstances, unquote. The same section provides that the default will obtain, quote, unless otherwise unambiguously indicated, unquote, by the offeror. The reasonable medium rule is the default, and the unambiguously indicated requirement provides the altering rule. Not every contract rule can be contracted around. Those that cannot be changed are termed mandatory or immutable rules. Mandatory rules are established by both courts and legislators. The common law has also established immutable limits, for example, on the maximum amount of damages that parties can contract for. These are restrictions on so-called liquidated damages. And limits on the maximum length of covenants not to compete. The duty of good faith is a mandatory part of every agreement, 
although standards of good faith can, within reason, be altered by agreement. In the last 60 years, legislative and administrative bodies have promulgated a host of immutable rules that restrict freedom of contract. Some types of transactions, such as those concerning insurance and employment, have to a large extent been removed from the general law of contract and are now subject instead to a host of specific mandatory statutory rules. Since 1964, for example, employers have had an immutable duty not to discriminate on the basis of race or gender when making employment decisions. Many other commercial activities are subject to more limited mandatory rules covering issues such as antitrust, consumer protection, and anti-terrorism. Even the relatively simple construction of a private home is awash with immutable duties. Default rules are not just about contract law, though. Every realm of law can be characterized as a mixture of default and mandatory provisions. Every area of law has this mixture. The law of intestacy is the default legal treatment of people who die without a will. Corporate law is awash with default rules and, again, a, a mixture of mandatory rules as well. Cumulative voting used to be the default rule of corporate democracy, but now straight or non-cumulative voting is the legal default. Even constitutional law is a mixture of default and mandatory laws. For example, Article 4 of our Constitution includes the mandate that full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. That's the full faith and credit clause. But then it immediately goes on to say that, quote, Congress may by general laws prescribe the effect thereof, unquote, thus suggesting that the effects of the state's full faith and credit duty can be altered by Congress. For the rest of your legal education, Indeed, for the rest of your life in the law, it's useful whenever you learn a new rule to identify whether the rule can be contracted around, and if so, how. Indeed, a worthwhile exercise after reading each case is to consider what contractual provisions would be sufficient to reverse the course's decision. If there is no language that could reverse the decision, make the losing party win, no altering rules for displacing this default result, then the court is applying a mandatory rule. It's also important to think about the policy considerations that are relevant to setting legal defaults and altering rules. As an initial normative matter, you should always question whether it's reasonable to limit freedom of contract by making a legal rule immutable. I'll be talking about this in the next lecture. If a particular rule is not going to be immutable, how should the lawmakers set the default? The traditional answer is giving the parties what they would have hypothetically contracted for if they had expressly contracted. But this hypothetical contracting rule is often devilishly difficult uh, to apply in practice. It's hard to know what terms two parties would have arrived at given their individual interests, relative bargaining power, other opportunities, and so forth. Often the best a court can do is adopt instead a majoritarian <laughs> approach and seek out which terms most parties in similar circumstances would prefer. For example, uh, in the sale of goods contracts covered by the Uniform Commercial Code, if the parties fail to name a price, the UCC fills the gap with a reasonable price default. Most parties are probably these kinds of par parties probably contract for a, a reasonable price. Who wants an unreasonable price? Which is normally going to be cashed out as closely related to the market price. Indeed, anytime you see the word reasonable included in the description of a, def uh, of a default, there's a good chance that hypothetical or majoritarian gap filling is at work. But the law sometimes chooses to fill gaps with terms that do not accord with the hypothetical contracting approach. Whereas the UCC will fill in a missing price with the reasonable price, it does not fill in quantity gaps by trying to divine what have, would have been a reasonable quantity. Instead, the impact of the UCC statute of fraud is often to create de facto a quantity default of zero. Uh, 
the contra proferendum rule, which is Latin to say to resolve a contractual amb ambiguity by interpreting the contract against the drafting party, th this contra proferendum rule seems to aim to penalize sloppy drafting rather than attempting to divine what the parties would have expressly contracted for if they had been asked to resolve the ambiguity themselves. These departures might at times make good sense. Sometimes it might be useful to establish defaults that penalize one or both parties in ways that encourages the parties to provide information by contracting around the default. Penalty defaults or information forcing defaults that intentionally penalize a contractor failing to fill a gap can further both equity and efficiency by giving a contractor the incentive to expressly say to the other party and to the world what they want. A penalty default rule is a rule that the contractors would not have wanted. Its presence in the right case will provide contractors an incentive to contract around the default rule and therefore to choose affirmatively the contract provision they prefer. In contrast to the received wisdom, penalty defaults are purposely set at what the parties would not want in order to encourage the parties to reveal information to each other or to third parties, especially courts. When strategic consideration cause a more knowledgeable party not to raise issues that, improve, that could improve contractual efficiency, a penalty default that penalizes the more informed party may encourage the revelation of information. The Hadley rule, which limits consequential damages to those that are foreseeable by the breaching party, is arguably an information-forcing default of just this kind. It gives the party with hidden information about its unforeseeable losses, in this case, in the case of breach, it gives them a new reason to share that information with the other side. Only by revealing that you as a buyer are likely to suffer unusual losses in the case of seller breach will you be able to recover uh, extra damages from a breaching seller. In fact, there are a host of reasons besides information forcing that can cause a minoritarian default, that is a default that only a minority of contracting parties would actually prefer. Minoritarian rules might be justified by differences in private cost of contracting, differences in private cost of failing to contract, differences in the public cost of filling gaps, differences in private information about the law. At the end of the day, the choice of an efficient default does not boil down merely to a choice between the majoritarian rule, for which most contractors would have contracted, and a penalty default designed to induce a contractor to reveal information about her type. Instead, efficiency-minded lawmakers will often need to consider a host of factors to decide whether it is more efficient to choose a default that only a minority values. Finally, once lawmakers have decided that a rule should be contractable and decided whether to adopt majoritarian or minoritarian default, they must still establish separate rules governing how private parties can contract around the default legal treatment. Altering rules establish the necessary and sufficient conditions for displacing a default. Usually lawmakers try to facilitate contractual freedom and efficiency will allow multiple altering means so as to minimize the cost of contracting around a default. But as with the default setting, the setting of altering rules should take into account the costs of altering, the cost of various kinds of error, and the possibility that altering can impose negative externalities on others. There are two broad reasons for structuring altering rules that deviate from merely minimizing transaction costs. First, at times it will be more important to minimize the cost of party error, especially non-drafter error. And third party error, especially judicial error, than it is to minimize the cost of altering. Second, when externality concerns or paternalistic concerns protect the, the con contractors themselves are insufficient to justify a full-blown mandatory rules, lawmakers might at times impose 
impeding altering rules, which intentionally deter subsets of contractors from contracting for legally disfavored provisions. Impeding altering rules produce an intermediate category of quasi-mandatory or sticky defaults, which manage but do not eliminate externalities and paternalism concerns. What is the last legal rule that you learned? Is it a mandatory or a default rule? Identify a mandatory rule uh, on your word processing system. Identify a default rule of your word processing system and describe in detail the altering rules associated with that default. Would it be better for contract law to set the reasonable quantity as the default quantity for contracts? The law can limit contractual freedom by prohibiting certain kinds of contracts. Thus, federal law prohibits the sale of human organs. These laws that limit freedom of contract create inalienable rights and duties. The law can also limit contractual freedom by prohibiting certain terms in agreement. These laws create mandatory or immutable rules. Mandatory rules, for example, prohibit unconscionable terms or place mandatory ceilings on the amount of liquidated damages. There is a surprising consensus among academics that there are only two normative justifications for restricting freedom of contract. Put, put most simply, immutable rules are justifiable if society wants to protect parties within the contract or parties outside the contract. The former justification turns on paternalism the latter on externalities. Immutable rules limit freedom of contract and the, this limitation is justified only if unregulated contracting would be socially deleterious because parties internal or external to the contract cannot adequately protect themselves. For example, we prohibit willing contractors from agreeing to pollute or agreeing to assassinate the governor because of the negative third-party effects. In contrast, we prohibit infants from entering contracts because of paternalism concerns. Both paternalism and externality concerns are concerns about in the inadequacy of consent. The in externality concern is the concern that third parties haven't had the opportunity to consent or withhold their consent to the transaction. The paternalism concern is, th is the concern that one of the nominal parties to the contract does not have the capacity to provide informed consent. Some mandatory limitations may be motivated by a mixture of externality and paternalism concerns. For example, federal law now prohibits prepayment penalties in certain mortgages. This mandatory limitation might be motivated by a concern with the negative social consequences seen in recent housing crises, as well as by a concern that individual borrowers are not adequately informed about the potential problem that such prepayment penalties can produce, for example, in trying to refinance their home. So, if you encounter a rule that is mandatory, you should ask yourself whether the rule can be justified by paternalism or by externality concerns. The distinction is important because there are different potential solutions to these two different concerns. Externality concerns might be alternatively solved by giving third parties a right to veto contracts that adversely affect them. Veto rights effectively make the affected parties internal to the contract, so there's no longer an externality concern. In contrast, Paternalism concerns might be assuaged by improving the ability of existing contractors to protect themselves, rather than by extinguishing their contractual freedoms. Libertarians are particularly suspicious of paternalism justifications, because it might be more appropriate to preserve con contractual freedom by providing 
the private parties with better information about the consequences of their decisions, making uh, of their decision making than by eliminating their autonomy to consent to contracts of their choosing. Should the law enforce an agreement between heterosexual spouses entered into at the time of marriage in which the woman spouse promises to notify the male spouse of any pregnancy and or of her intention to have an abortion unless the woman in good faith believes that such notification would subject the woman to a risk of psychological or physical harm? If you believe that such an agreement should not be enforceable, is this restriction on women's contractual freedom best justified by paternalism or externality concerns? Thank you.